This study unit is devoted to the PDP-11 instruction set. The instruction set is used hand in hand with the addressing modes covered in the previous unit to construct the programs used with any PDP-11 system. As you may recall from an earlier study unit, the PDP-11 has only one instruction set. This single instruction set can operate on any element in the PDP-11 system. These instructions can manipulate data contained in the CPU or in memory or in an I.O. register. The instruction set may be divided into special instructions and basic instructions. The basic instruction set is implemented in its entirety in all PDP-11 processors. The special instructions are used only with larger processors, such as the PDP-1145 and PDP-1170. Because every PDP-11 has all of the basic instructions, you can see that each PDP-11 has a powerful and virtually complete instruction set. This study unit is devoted to the basic instructions common to all PDP-11 systems. These basic instructions may be divided into three separate groups. We'll begin by looking at the first group. The first group consists of single operand instructions. Notice that the instruction word is divided into two parts. The first part specifies the operation or job to be performed by the instruction. The second part provides information which enables us to locate the operand. The second group consists of double operand instructions. Notice the similarity between this group and the previous group. The prime difference, as implied by the name, is that this group deals with two operands rather than one. Other than that, it's much the same. The first part of the word specifies the operation. The second and third parts of the word provide information allowing us to find the first and second operands. The final group consists of program control instructions. This group is significantly different from the previous two groups because we're not dealing with operands at all. The first part of the word specifies some action to be performed. The second part tells us where that action will take place in the program. Now, let's take a more detailed look at the first group, the single operand instructions. In the upper right corner of your screen, you can see the entire single operand word. Right now, we want to concentrate on just the first part and see what it does. This part of the word, which consists of bits 6 through 15, is called the operation or opcode. Bit 15 indicates whether the selected operation is to be performed on a full data word or on a half word, which we call a byte. The remaining bits specify the particular operation to be performed. What about the last part of a single operand word? Well, it's broken into two separate portions or fields, the addressing mode and the selected register. Does this instruction format look familiar to you? It should. We discussed it in the previous unit when we talked about addressing modes. Remember how it functions? That's right. The addressing mode combined with the selected register provides information allowing us to find the operand. Hence, this part of the instruction is called the destination field. Here is a typical single operand instruction, complement. The last part of the word contains the mode and register fields that indicate the location of the operand or the destination. The instruction begins by retrieving the operand from the specified destination so that it can do its job, in this case, complementing the operand. Once the instruction has completed its job, it stores the result back into the destination. This is a key point for single operand instructions. The result of any operation is always stored back in the same destination location. CLR is the mnemonic for the clear instruction. The corresponding code is 0050DD. What exactly does that mean? Well, 0050 is the opcode which specifies a clear operation. DD indicates the two portions of the destination field used to specify the location of the operand. Suppose we wanted to clear general register R1. We would write the code 005001. 
The first four digits, 0050, indicate the opcode for a clear instruction. The last two octal digits, 0 and 1, indicate the location of the operand or the destination. The 0 specifies addressing mode 0, and the 1 specifies register 1. Mode 0, in conjunction with R1, tells the instruction to operate on the contents of R1. Therefore, this instruction says, clear the contents of register 1. What is the difference between a word and a byte instruction? Suppose we use a clear instruction and place a 0 in bit 15. That indicates a word instruction. If we were using the assembler, we would type in the mnemonic CLR. However, if we were to place a 1 in bit position 15, it would indicate that the clear instruction is to operate on a byte rather than a full word. In this case, we would use the assembler mnemonic CLRB. Now that we understand the format of single operand instructions, let's start putting these instructions together to do certain jobs. As we do, we'll also begin looking at the individual instructions in the single operand group. We might like to use the instructions to add a long series of numbers together. Here we see one method of doing this job. We get the first operand or number, then add the second operand to it, then add the third and so on for however many operands we have. Once we've added the last operand, we stop. The program has completed the job of adding an entire series of numbers. Notice that the instructions follow one another in a straight line. This is referred to as straight line programming. You might be thinking, what if we wanted to add 250 numbers together? What a terribly tedious program we'd have. We'd have to write 250 instructions before we stopped. Isn't there a better way of doing this job? Yes, there is. We could, for example, use what is known as a program loop. Here we obtain an operand, add it to the total, and then ask the question, are we done? If the answer is no, then we go back and get another operand, add it to the total, and again ask if we're done. If the answer is still no, then we continue the process. Once we've added the last number to the total and ask if we're done, the answer is yes, so we simply stop the program. You can see that a loop is a very efficient programming tool. It's a tool used very often in PDP-11 programs. At this point, you might ask, how do I form a loop? It's fine in theory, but how do I actually pose the question, am I done or not? Well, let's see. The PDP-11 instruction set has a group of branch instructions. A typical branch instruction tests a condition and asks if the condition is met. If it is met, then the program branches to some other location. If it is not met, then the program simply continues with the next instruction. This branch instruction allows us to form program loops. We test a condition and then decide whether to go one way or the other based on the results. There are actually a number of branch instructions in the PDP-11 instruction set, and we're going to cover them all a little later in the study unit. But for now, all we want you to remember is that a branch asks a question and based upon the answer, either causes the program to go to some new location or to continue with the next instruction. Keeping track of something is another useful tool. In programming terms, we refer to this as a tally. The tally is normally used to let us know when we no longer need to loop and can therefore either stop or continue with the next program instruction. First we ask, how many items do we want to keep track of? Then we count one. We ask next, are we done counting? If the answer is no, we keep counting until we're done. Once we have completed our count, we simply exit from the program loop. Now, let's see how we might implement this tally in a PDP-11 system. First of all, how many items do we want to count? Assume we'd like to count 25 items. Let's load the desired count of 25 into a general purpose register, in this case, R1. Next, we want to count one item. We can do this quite simply by decrementing the register. So, to count 1, we decrement R1, and now we have 24. Are we done? If the answer is no, we want to keep counting. 
Therefore, we use an instruction that will branch if R1 is not zero. In other words, if our desired count has not reached zero, we must loop around, decrement our count again, and keep going. Eventually, the value in R1 will reach zero. The branch instruction is no longer effective, so we go to the next instruction, which is halt. This stops the program. That's basically how we implement a tally. Both the tally and loop are primarily techniques used in programming. Since you already understand the workings of a tally and a loop, let's go on and look at a program designed to solve a specific problem. This is the problem we're trying to solve. A particular area of memory contains salary information for all employees of the company. However, review time has just been completed, raises have been doled out, and now we must clear out the old salary information to make room for the new data. There are only two known factors, the starting address and the last address of where the salary information is located in memory. In effect, all we know are the boundaries of the block of memory that contains the salary data. Our initial step is to clear the first byte location in memory. We can use the single operand clear byte instruction to do this. Now we must find the next location in memory. To do this, we move the location pointer by incrementing it. Increment is another single operand instruction. Our next step is to keep track or tally the number of locations that have already been cleared. We do this by decrementing our counter. By the way, notice that we have used three single operand instructions so far, clear, increment, and decrement. The final step is to see if we're done. If we haven't finished, we'll branch back in a loop and clear the next memory location. If we are done, we'll stop the program at this point. This flowchart shows the steps used to solve our problem. First, we clear one location. Then we go to the next location. We count or keep track of how many locations have been cleared. Finally, we ask if we're done. If not, we do it all again. If we are done, then we stop the program. Implementation of this flowchart is accomplished by selecting instructions to perform each of the steps. We use a clear byte instruction to clear the contents of the memory location. Note that address is in parenthesis, indicating that we are clearing the contents of the specified address. In order to go to the next location, we increment our starting address, which moves the pointer to the next sequential memory location. To determine how many locations have been cleared, we decrement the count. After that, we check for done by using a branch instruction. If we're not done, we branch back to the start of the program and do it all over again. If we are done, we go to the next instruction, which is a halt. How can we go about setting this all up? Let's start out by making an address pointer. We can do this by placing the starting address of 600 into register R0. You can see that the memory bank we want to clear contains 30 byte locations expressed in octal notation. Therefore, let's load an octal value of 30 into register R1 and use R1 as a counter. The program starts with a clear byte R0 instruction. R0 points to starting address 600 in the memory. This instruction says, clear the contents of the address specified by R0. Therefore, memory location 600 is cleared. The counter is unaffected at this time. Now we must advance our pointer to the next location to be cleared. The increment R0 instruction moves our pointer to the next location in memory. Next, we use a decrement R1 instruction to decrement the counter. We have already cleared one memory location and moved our pointer to the next location. So, now we want to indicate we've cleared a location. Notice that our counter uses octal numbers. Therefore, when we decrement R1, the count goes from octal 30 to octal 27. The branch start instruction is then used to determine if we're finished. A branch occurs only if R1 is not zero. In this case, R1 is not zero. It's octal 27. Therefore, we branch back to start and repeat this program. In this case, R1 is zero indicating that the required number of memory locations have all been cleared. 
Because R1 is zero, the branch is ineffective, and the program goes to the next instruction, halt, which stops the program. As you can see, this program to clear out a series of specified memory locations is a small program consisting of only five instructions. However, is there any way we could reduce the number of instructions needed to do this job? Remember these, the eight addressing modes we discussed in the previous study unit? We showed you how selection of the proper addressing mode in combination with the instruction would make that instruction more powerful. In this case, suppose we pick mode two, which is the auto increment mode. We've improved the original program by eliminating one complete instruction. By using the clear byte instruction in the auto increment mode, we've actually combined the clear and the increment instruction in the original program. In our improved version, we're saying clear the byte specified by R0 and then increment R0. In other words, clear the memory location then move the pointer to the next sequential location. All this is done with a single instruction used in combination with the auto increment addressing mode. The program we've just analyzed clears only one byte at a time. Suppose we'd like to clear a full word at a time. Is this possible? Yes, it is. The first thing we must do is to convert our byte pointer to a word pointer. This is a simple task. Instead of using a clear byte instruction, we use a clear instruction. Clear R0 plus says clear a full word of memory, then increment the pointer by two so it points to the next sequential word location. Our second and only other step is to change the contents of the counter. In our original program, we were dealing with bytes of data and we used an octal count of 30. Now, if we want to deal with words, we simply load half the original count, which is octal 14. That's all we have to do to change the original program into a word rather than a byte program. Before we go on, let's take a short break.